Hello and welcome to a new show of mine. I'm going to be doing video game development in Leaf. And for those of you who don't know, Leaf is a language I've been working on for a while now. And is it ready to do video games? Absolutely not. That's what's going to make the show very interesting. Is we're going to go through everything from video game design to graphics to GL and actual write down at the compiler, standard library, everything. We're literally going to be building a game from scratch. Well, except for a few bits that we already have. And we're going to start with a game called Wormies, Tron, Snakey, whatever you know this name as. Wormies happens to be the name I first developed this game under. Let's take a look. Where I'm motivated with this is when I was playing coding game, we actually have a this is one of the competitions I did. I was doing this in Rust. And you can see the Tron game. This is the Tron battle right here. The You'll know this as a Snakes game. And I was going through this game and I was trying to explain how this worked, how the algorithm... We have an algorithm that does reasonably well, and it's not the one I submitted, but... And I wanted to do the graphics to show, well, how would this game actually work? What am I doing in the algorithms? And then I there got down to work on Leaf, and I started doing coding of the graphics. And I realized, well... Instead of just showing how this works, why don't we just program this in Leaf? Let's program this game. It's a good start. We can obviously go a lot more than what they have here. We know we have the AI backend now, so we could actually make this with the CPU player because we're doing well enough here that we can play against CPU player. And so that's what I've been doing for the last month is getting Leaf in a position, hacking as much stuff as I could together, SDL, OpenGL, just to get us to the point where we can actually start doing this stuff. So let's take a point. I'm going to close this now. Um, or just make it go away. I'm going to take a look now at where are we right now. And this is the current thing that we do in Leap. This is as far as I've gotten. <clears throat> this is my graphics demo so far. And I mean, it's not, it doesn't look like much. And honestly, it's, it really isn't that much. But it's using OpenGL. It's using the attributes. It's using SDL. And most importantly of all of this, this is written in Leaf. This is my language. If you want to go check out the, I just close this one here, I guess. If you want to go check out the website, it's over here. Website is needs to be updated, of course. As always, everything about Leaf needs to be updated and expanded. But this is my language, and we're working on it. And so this is the key thing here: is I've written this in Leaf, and we can take a quick look at that. Make sure you open the right window. <laughs> and this is in the GL demo in the main. Now, this isn't, in terms of a new language, this isn't going to look like much. Let's focus on, like, maybe the main function first. You'll see a few different things, like do and on fail, some basic handling. You'll notice the complete lack of semicolons. These commas are likely also to go away, but they still need them for now. And all the things prefixed with SDL, if you've ever done SDL programming, you should recognize these. Um, Omar, so what we're going to be doing today is... We're going to be writing that Wormies game from scratch in Leaf. We're going to see how far we go. We're going to attempt to do it in this new language, see what we can do. And we're going to do it with, with, with SDL, with GL, with our fragment shaders, and again, all in Leaf. So this is Leaf code right here. This is the demo right now that's working. Obviously not been impressed with the demo, but it is when you consider that this is all Leaf code. So this is all the compiler that I've done. This is the language that I've been working on. And most of this, because it's mainly GL code, is it's not pretty. GL is not pretty regardless of what language you do it. And let's, let's be realistic here. But this is in Leaf, and so the animation there is just a few vertex attributes. And I've got the minimal shader set up for this, but this isn't where we're going to be starting. We're going to start from absolute scratch, and we're going to go through all of this. So if anybody's interested in the language, please do check it out. It's leaflang.org. Otherwise, just sit back and enjoy. If you have questions, go for it. But I'm going to warn you in advance this is going to be a long, long, rough ride because they said Leaf is by no means ready to produce a game. There's just stuff missing. This is going to be rough. And as we go through the show, I'm just going to make notes of the stuff that's missing. We'll do some of the compiler stuff on the show. There's going to be defects. There's a lot of stuff that we just have to do. We And so just really, nothing's prepared here. And of course, I don't have a game library. We're going to be doing this against Raw GL which nowadays we can see as a convenience library for Vulkan, but no, okay. <laughs> when you raw GL and SDL, I have no wrappers around all of these. These are already great enough wrappers, so I don't have to do system-dependent stuff. But, so the end here is this game here. 
a game like this, and we'll, we could do better than this because, you know, I don't want any simple graphics like that, but if we get to this point at least, we'll be happy. So that's what I'm doing today, and you'll see I have SDL things open and the GL reference open, and I'll be using my editor of choice, not the visual code for this, mainly because I would have to write yet another syntax highlighter for another language, for another adapter, or another language. So I'll be doing this in Kate, which has lots of problems lately, which is very unfortunate, but we're gonna go with that. So with that, let's just get started. Let's get started with the basics of creating a new program. And I'm gonna start close to from scratch and see what happens. What did I change here? I shouldn't have changed anything. And so I'm just gonna copy this first little bit here and I'm going to switch back and forth. Usually I do a split screen programming, but it's a bit hard because I don't have the space for it on a display. And so let's go over here. Let's do the SDL. It's in the SDL library here. And I'm going to make a directory in here just because I have other libraries in here. And we're going to call this Wormies. Again, I'm calling it Wormies because I actually wrote this game once a long, long time ago, and I called it Wormies. And it's long since been gone. The code, everything's gone. And let's just call this one main.leaf. Leaf files end with a dot leaf extension. And I'll explain this as I go, some of the syntax, because I doubt any of you are familiar with any of this. I'll remove this bit I don't need for now. Import math and import sys. You should be able to recognize stuff like this from other languages. Again, don't be fooled about these things here. Here, these are not complete modules. These are very limited. They do very little things. And again, I've had to write all of those as well. And we'll be extending those during the show. And the main thing is we do a run function. And if it fails, we print what failure we got. Very basic. This is most likely this setup is going to become the default main function at some point. But right now, it's not. So basically, you write main. You don't have to do the standard wrapping. It's just right now, if you don't do this and you get an error, it crashes and you have no idea why. So we're going to call SDLGL window. And we're gonna make it a fixed size for now. What SDLGO window is, I can give you a look at that quickly. Under our lib directory, we have a GL, SDLGO window. And this is a service class which encodes the setup of a GL window using SDL. It does the basic setting of the bit depth, the depth buffer, double buffering, our options for the display and the name and things like that and we check the errors for it. It has a constructor. You'll notice the constructor is marked as a construct function and it has a default and the destroy function is called when it's destroyed. And a lot of this stuff here is just back end. It's just hooking up to the back end for SDL. The SDL file is not so pretty if you take an S the raw SDL files. These are all the imports from the from the actual SDL library. This will be automated at some point. Right now, I've hard coded this by hand. I've just done it by hand, but we'll automate library import at some point. So we have this SDL window here, and that would be enough to get something displayed. It's going to disappear on us right away. So let's do one more thing. Let's go back to the main one. We have a main loop here. I copy the main part of the loop. This is not yet abstracted, and I don't know how much just too early to abstract this. I really don't know how this thing's going to work. And so the main loop is an event loop. If you've ever done like desktop programming, you'll be very similar with event loops. Or SDL is a common one. Windows is another one. Um, X Windows has the same type of thing. And we just handle two events for now. If we quit, we stop running. And if we get a window event, we have to set the new GLV port. This is standard stuff that's just we have to do on our own, and that should be enough to actually get some window working. So let's go out of here, kill the other one, and so right now I don't have Leaf installed, obviously because it's it's not in a packageable state. But what I have is this distribution directory, which is actually a I can't highlight that way, which is a distrib version. So this is the one that's actually online. I've pushed this now. Like, yeah, I've pushed this up. So everything you now, if you want to do this, you can actually follow along. Um, it will be rough. There's a long setup right now, but that's to be expected. And we have to say which library you want to use, library SDL2. And we're going to use the image library as well. We don't use it yet, but we have imports from it. And we need to use library GL. I don't have any build scripts yet or anything. 
you can alias all this, but let's just do it this way, and we're gonna have wormies. And so these are two directories. Lib is just a bunch of files. Oh, and I keep trying to highlight stuff. And wormies is the directory we wanna run. And this, if everything works right, should give us a window. It is a window. That's all we care about. This is a window. Ignore what's in it. Please just ignore what's in it. <laughs> um, the reason there's nothing here is because it's GL. It's created a blank canvas for us. You know, we've not drawn anything to it. So let's take care of that right away first. Let's actually draw something in it, a blank canvas. And we're gonna keep referring back to these programs here. And the blank canvas, I'm sorry about the font size. It doesn't seem to stick. Again, Kate doesn't like a lot of things, but I'll just copy it over. We have a clear color, clear color. Let's use that. And where do we actually set the color? We're gonna clear it each time. You clear the buffer and the depth buffer. In leaf, you'll notice flags are handled by the OR operator, whereas in C or something, you'd see the OR bit flag. I'm using names for these things because they're not used as often, and those other things have more important purposes in the language. And a clear color, here we go. Clear color. Let's just make this, yeah, almost black. And run that again. And, uh oh, I forgot something. Again, it's GL. We have no benefit of any kind of standard library here. We have to actually swap these things. Otherwise, nothing will draw. And this is a just GL function. Yeah. So we have a black gray window. And good. You don't see it, but the resize event is required to resize this correctly. Otherwise, it won't draw in the other area. I can show you that quickly as well. If we take out the viewport command, it probably won't draw correctly. Oh, it might. Maybe because it's clearing. Oh, well. Doesn't matter. When we've got images, it'll fail. Now, a bit about how Leaf runs here. You see, I'm not generating an executable here. Leaf has two modes. This current mode is it's running in memory. This is actually compiling it. It's a feature of LLVM. That's the back end I use. So actually, I generate LLVM IR code, and it has the feature to compile this in memory in their JIT. And that will run it in memory, even including linking to the libraries, the form function interface, which is just great. That wasn't working two versions ago, so I'm super happy it's working now. And that means you have a super fast turnaround. You just like, this compiles and runs it in memory. No need to generate an executable. Of course, if you want to in Leaf, you can simply generate an executable temp slash demo and then run temp slash demo. And that's the same thing. So this is the setup. This is how Leaf works. It has those two modes. And I'm really thankful for LLVM supporting these two modes. And it just makes it so much nicer to develop when you don't have to compile first. I mean, technically it's compiling and we'll go from there. So now what we need to do is where to start a game. This is a big question. When we're doing the coding game stuff on the Evening Rust show, where I'm using a Rust language, the game's pretty much started for you, and you're actually doing an AI, so you don't have to start as much. But we're going to start in a similar sort of view. We're going to have to start with some sort of state. And we're going to create this in a separate file, because why not? In, in Leaf, you have the advantage. It doesn't matter how many files you create. You don't have to worry about the ordering of the files or anything like this. Just, just open up files, create them, and it packs them all together in directory, create one module out of it. And we're going to create a class called game. I just say game. Now we might want to call this a service instead, and I can explain the difference later, but let's start with a class game. And we know we have a worm on the screen. We have a few things game has to have. We call it game.leaf. Get the highlighting, game.leaf. What are the key things we want to have? We want to have a width, we want to have a height, and we want to have the position of the player. But let's actually create a point class for that as well. Point two. And this is actually x is a float and y is a float. Um, maybe not. Maybe these should be integers. So we're going to call it an integer point. I just call it an i point too. I recognize this name from. Actually, just call it i point because it's game specific. We're not going to have more than that. An i point, and this is an integer 
and this is an integer. So the game has a size, large size, which is an I point, and it has a current, let's say, for now, let's just put head position, head position I point. And we don't know, let's put a default constructor, define default, and let's take no arguments. The default constructor just says size equals, um, what should we do? We should give it, I don't know, let's do 30 by 20. It's a reasonable size. And the head position, we're gonna put it right in the middle at 15. We're not right in the middle, so we can do testing. It's 15 comma seven, somewhere up there. It's at top right, we'll start there. So this is our basic game. And you notice a lot of things in the leaf. This is not a dynamic language. It, it may look sometimes to have syntax like a dynamic language, like JavaScript or Python. You notice I just say these brackets here. This is all statically typed. It's just using a lot of type inferencing. It's saying, look, this 30 comma 20, this is a generic tuple of 30 and 20. And it looks and says, well, this is an I point. Does this 30 and 20 match to an I point? It goes, yeah, it does. It fits, so do it. And same with head position. And the same with the function itself. You notice functions are also done by assignments. And this is actually the function notation marker. If I expanded this a bit, you'd understand a bit more that these are the arguments it takes and these are the return values. But if you don't have any, you can completely omit them. Construct is a special one saying, how is this thing constructed? And I'm gonna go back to the other one now, main. And we're gonna create a state here as well. We're gonna do a var game. And we're gonna make a shared state. This is where it's gonna be different. Type shared game. And this is actually where we can't use the name game. It has to be like an instance of a game. So we're gonna say state shared game. And it takes, the, this will create something the default shared one. We can do this more, we can do this easier just by saying it's a shared game. And this will automatically initialize that. And this doesn't change anything yet, of course. Unless we get an error, oops. Sorry, nothing's actually changed yet. And what we wanna do is we wanna draw on the screen where the current state is. Shared means it's a shared value, and we'll get a bit more into this later, that in Leaf, everything by default is copied by value as opposed to copied by reference. So if you pass a non-shared game to a function that took a game, it would actually copy the whole state over, and that's not what we want. There's a special service type that wraps it up, and I'm uncertain of that. This is an area where the language is gonna have to be a lot of work on clearly going through this. Not really a very exciting show, but if you're interested in that, just send me an email and you can work through it with us. So now we need to create some sort of fragment shader, because this is the key point now. We have to somehow get this person on the screen. And that's the first step. We gotta get a box to move around the screen before we can do the worm, because this has a state in it. And we're gonna map it to the screen, and how do we do this? Well, let's do, we have to create a program. We're gonna create a simple vertex shader. Again, this is OpenGL, we're starting with nothing. So let's start with the vertex shader from the demo. We can open up both of these, the two fragments. I'm gonna save them as something else. And what should we call this one? Wormies. Let's just call this one boxes, because hey, why not? Boxes, the vertex shader. And I put version one three up here, and I really, I'm not using many features. I think it's just for this in notation. These are not gonna be very advanced uh, GL coach moment. But what do we have? We have to have a series of positions. We're not gonna do texture coordinates. We don't need those. And this in vector is really just gonna be all of the, the boxes where we're gonna draw. And so right now we're gonna get rid of the position and size. And we're gonna uniform, we're gonna do, I'm wondering whether we should actually do the uniform size on the CPU side or on the GPU side. This is a little bit different and that is, Will the coordinates we give in this position be GPU or VTU? And this is just some name I inherited from an example I saw somewhere. Let's just do this called vertex position. Vertex position and then we'll decide, I don't know which one's a better way to go yet. Usually we'd want to handle it. Actually, let's do it this way. They're gonna do in 
vec2. We're going to make these all game coordinates. So we're going to make it relative to the game itself, and that's the grid size of the game. And so the grid is going to have a game size. And so this is going to be vertex position dot x divided by game size dot x. And we're going to have to do the wacky GL stuff. And this is then times 2 minus 1, because we have to put this in clip coordinates, divided by game size dot y times 2 minus 1. And then the last ones are like that. GL position equals that. Don't need a text coordinate. So that's just a position. And then we have another one called basic frag, and we're going to put that in there as well. And this will be boxes.frag. This is our fragment shader. We don't have a texture coordinates. Out vector is just going to be, I guess, fragments. Change the name of it. I caps lock on. Fragment. And for now, we're just going to do a float four. I think that's, oh man, how do you do this in GL? I haven't done this in a while. Let's just make it green for now. Remove all the other stuff. So this should just draw a box on the screen if we put it in the right position. Now we have to use this stuff, and this is where I might actually open up a split window here. I want to split the view vertical. No, that's not what I wanted. I always get that wrong. I, I want them vertically because I want them stacked vertically. I don't want them split vertically. Split view horizontal is what I want. All right, so here we're going to go into our main code, and we have main leaf here. And we're going to have to draw something. The game has a state. We know what that state is, and we have to communicate that with the GL somehow. And these are going to be done through uniforms. SDL, GL demo. Now let's go back up to the top where we have this program. This GL program is a small abstraction over GL. I managed to get that working first, not because I want to hide it from you, but just because I need to get something work so it won't be ridiculous here. And we're going to call var program GL program. And we're going to get out our, oh, we're going to attach the stuff first. Attach vertex shader. And this is in wormies slash boxes.vert. Program that attach fragment shader. Boxes.frag. Now, I apologize if you came here hoping to look for some graphics, but I really wanted to start from the very beginning for the show. As we get on, there'll be more graphics and more stuff to show, and the, the code will look a little more organized. But this is just, I just want to start from absolute scratch, basically. Again, I did prepare some stuff, at least, so it's not so ridiculous. And so we attach these fragment shaders, and we have to link it. These will fail. This is using Leaf's fail mix, and somehow these don't work. It'll fail on us. And we're going to have to use that down here as well, program.use. We only have one. It's inefficient to keep calling it, but we don't care. And so we have an error in the shader, expecting comma or that. And which one? I don't know. Uh, boxes vert. Um, int right here, probably. <laughs> it's really getting annoying with this font size. Um, yeah, how do you create floats again? Is it just, do you just, just do that? Vec4, yeah, Vec4 sounds good. That's, that's what I wanted. Float4 is from the product fuse I work on. Vec4 is what I want. Too many languages. Um, I forgot to save that, I think. And our box is frag, it's a Vec4. That looks better. All right, so nothing air, nothing fails, so we're using those shaders now. It doesn't look like much. It doesn't look like we're using them, but trust me, we're using those shaders. So let's grab some attributes out of here. And this is how we have to do it in, in GL. So we have two attributes in there. In the vertex shader, we have a game size. That's really the only one. Vertex position and game size. 
And this is actually a uniform. There's only one game size and absolutely everything will use that. And it has a vertex position which is the in. So game size and vertex position. Var vertex. V position, position, and the position subsect here is, it looks a little ridiculous because this is now the position of the attributes. Get attribute location, vertex position, vertex position, and var game size position equals program.get uniform location. And these map fairly closely to the GL functions of the same name. Game size. So we have these two positions. Now, what we're going to do so let's create a vertex buffer. I'll copy the one down there below. It's GL buffer. GL buffer is another minor wrapper around it. It's a GL float two, which I'm going to have to create as well. And this is going to go into GL array buffer. Now I'm using indexes here, and this probably isn't helpful to use indexes, but I'm going to keep using them because I know it works. And so let's stick with the index-based approach to drawing right now because I know it's going to work. And we'll add some buffers to this and vertex data dot push and we're going to take the game size itself this is, a little, this is going to be a little bit weird let's just take what they have there let's just take any old value first this is going to be in game size so do we have we have states yeah okay state where's our game leaf state dot head position dot y x state dot head position dot y and we're going to push four of these, and they're going to have position.x plus one, position.y plus one. And I don't know if I'm going to do inverted or not yet. Hey, baggers, how's it going? We're doing some fun stuff, I think. <laughs> so these are the vertex positions, and we're going to have to actually draw. I'm going to create the indexes now. Let's go back to the other one. Again, this will take a little bit of effort to get the first thing drawn, but we should be okay. And we're going to create an index. And this is the exact same index, so I'm just going to copy them over. We're drawing one box for now, index data. And I have this function called bind and push, and this maps to pushing it to the vertex buffer. I haven't pushed this one yet, because we're going to do that dynamically. And we're just going to copy the same basic thing. And if we go down here a bit... So, oh, you have an SDL issue. I love SDL issues. I've been fighting SDL issues for like the last four weeks. And <laughs> weird SDL issues, my friend. Um, <laughs> I can totally understand that. Now, just imagine having your weird SDL issue in a language that you wrote with your own compiler. I spend half the time wondering where is the actual fault. I don't even know if there is a fault sometimes. Okay, so let's go down and where do we draw this stuff? We have program use, geo clear color. And we're going to have to do something here, something magical. I forget which one I want to do. First thing we're going to do is we're going to, after this, we're going to enable a vertex buffer. This is, again, all GL stuff. This will eventually be abstracted, I hope. V position up position. Let's enable this position. We only have one. And I'm just going to assume it works. I'm not going to check the air. If something breaks, we're going to check the air later. And these will eventually be wrapped so you don't have to check the air. And now we actually have to bind the data. Vertex attrib pointer. V position position. This is the buffer position we're doing. Two, I've heard that's the number. We have, a, we have two for the position. Float. GL false, I've forgotten what that flag is. And two times GL float dot aligns value size. This align value size, this is a feature of leaf. Now this GL float is align value size, and this is very specific. When you have like an operator like size of and C, 
if you don't specifically know what size of is doing, it can be very surprising because it doesn't give you the size of a value. And so even this name here, when I say aligned value size, this is still technically incorrect, but it's in closer. What this is, is the size required to contain that value in an aligned bit of memory. And if you've ever done structures at C level, you'll understand why that may not be the same as the actual size of the value. And this is basically, if you pack these things into an array or a structure, how much room you have to keep between them, or if you have a structure of varying sizes, how big it's gonna end up being regardless. And so this is the stride size here. So here we go, zero. And we're gonna skip checking the air again because I don't care. It's gonna just, we're just gonna assume it's gonna work. Okay, and then we have to do, we don't have texture, so screw that. We have some set uniforms though, set uniform. And what one do we have? Game size dot position. Game size dot, game size position. And what are we trying to set here? We said state dot, and what do we call it? Uh, state dot size. size.x, state.size.y. And we're gonna get an error here because these are integers, but we wanna cast them to floats because you very specifically wanna cast them to a GL float. Now you'll see this, this lossy notation here. Leaf is type safe. Leaf will not allow any implicit conversions that lose data. And so if you have a 64-bit integer Obviously, that cannot be converted to a float. Not even a 32-bit integer can be converted to a float correctly. And GL floats are 32-bit. So what we do is we say lossy. We're going to say that's all right. You're allowed to convert to this float and take whatever loss that happens to be. It's putting the onus on the programmer to make sure they've done the right thing at this point. I will not do implicit conversion, and you have to say that. Now, obviously, a 32-bit integer will, of course, fit in a 64-bit float, that's possible, as well as 16-bit integer in a normal float. But for genericity, we're just gonna put them integers for now. You could, of course, say 16-bit if you really wanted to lower the range, but we won't do that for now. So we set this uniform. Man, I'd really like to see something draw. <laughs> so we have game size, we have the vertex attributes, I think, and now we should be able to bind the buffer that's drawing it. Gina element array buffer. This is the index data dot get buffer. Get buffer is just the actual GL buffer name. I'm gonna draw elements. I have no idea why I'm using a triangle fan. We're gonna to have to change that, but this works. Triangle fans are like, they're rarely used now, aren't they? Are they used for 3D models maybe? Or is it even worthwhile? I don't know, there's like fans of fan. I just don't know anymore. It's been so long since I did it. And we're gonna clean up after ourselves every single time. Disable vertex, a trib array, the same one, V position, position, the one that we enabled. Okay, now let's see if we get any errors in this. All right, so, yeah, so we have an implicit conversion error in line 31. And it's not letting us convert here because these are the wrong types. And that is kind of annoying. And you'll notice I complained about this when I do the rush stream too, having to do lots of conversion. But in some cases it's necessary. In some cases you really should do it. I mean, because it's like, well, this isn't the right type. This doesn't fit in the float correctly. If you don't care about what it's fitting into, you can just mark the whole thing as lossy. You don't have to say an explicit type. And we can make what lossy here basically says, and this is actually kind of dangerous, is it says, well, whatever type you want, go for it. As long as there's some representation, just go for it. Don't care about precision loss whatsoever. And it's an unconstrained type at this point. It basically says any type will do. And we're just gonna do it that way for now. And we'll worry about that later because that's not really, you don't really want to do random conversions like that, but sometimes you just have to. All right, and we're missing something else. Um, line 33. 
I don't have all the error messages in place yet, but this one here is fairly clear. An open tuple block or value list does not appear to be correctly closed. At this point in the parser, it doesn't actually know. Well, actually it does know, but it doesn't know how to communicate that to the error system, which one of those it is. And so what did I screw up here? I forgot a bracket, there we go. Oh, and we forgot something in the shader, expected blah, and that's in, not saying what shader it is again, wonderful. Yeah, this probably needs to have a vec2, a type. All right, that's very green, very green. Okay, so we are drawing green, so we did something. Um, it's much too green, <laughs> and I have no idea how to debug GL, but that drew it very, very green, and why is that? We push the head position, lossy, lossy, vertex, 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 and we push the game size. So we should have a uniform in here. This should be drawn correctly but it's not. It was in the other program, so let's look very carefully with the other program again. Geo float text, there's nothing here. Vertex bind, check GL error. Um, do, 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 do. We forgot to do this step. Because I said it was dynamic, we, we haven't actually pushed the, the dynamic data yet. So that's vertex data dot bind and push GL dynamic draw. That's just saying how we're going to use it. So what do we have? There we have it. We have a dot on the screen. We have the head of a worm. And it's relative to our game size. This is perfect. We have an actual little thing on the screen. That that's I'm happy now. I knew this would work, but it took a while to get there. So let's check the status of GIST. We're going to add that. For some reason, I have an eggplant. I was using that for the test graphic. People make fun of my gra my eggplants all the time. And GL text, the wormies. Let's just add all these. Git commit to AM. Wormies head shown. And this module, this stuff is on GitHub if you're looking forward to that. Leaf itself is stored in Launchpad. Do GitHub dot mortuary dot leaf algorithms. There you go. The show was originally about algorithms, and I didn't have graphics, so now we're going to graphics. Going to go back to algorithms later. And so this will be SDL wormies. Unfortunately, there's no syntax highlighting here, so you're just going to have the raw files. But these are the leaf code for it. The next step we want to do is we want to make that little thing move around the screen. I did that in a test before, so I'm going to go back and look at that one. This was the other one. I'll close this for a second, and let's open up another file. And I had a demo called G uh, move, move, just GL, just move. This didn't involve GL. I'm going to leave the bottom small for reference because I'm just going to copy from there. And this is where we had another type up here for the event handling. And I'm packing this all in one function now. We're going to start restructuring this later. We really have to structure this out. But basic functionality first is king when you're working with a bunch of stuff that you just really don't know it's going to work. So the event type, if it equals SDL key down, then we do key cast. Let me just copy this, OK? This, this will be fine. Just copy it over. So these are the keyboard's keys, and we cast it. This is a, a weird leaf thing, cast pointer. This is another unsafe operation, which is absolutely essential when working with system libraries, though. I can't, I can't do anything about the fact that this SDL event is a union type in C, and it has to be cast to a specific type for me to use it. And in C, you have named things, which are basically a hidden cast, but this will do this. And so now we have state.move, and we have to write this function and we write that over in the game class. We can write a move function. 
x offset is an integer and y offset is y offset is also an integer. When you miss a return type, this doesn't mean there is no return type, it means it's implicit. If there is no return in here, there will be no return value. Just simplify some of it. So we can do this now. We can say head position dot x plus equals x offset. Head position dot y plus equals y offset. And we'll see very quickly what the problem with this is. And uh oh, it's not working. Oh, I know why it's not working. No. Any guesses as to why it's not working? Well, that's right here. When we do this, we have to reset the head position. This is going to be the GL stuff. Because we're still using a step. Well, not, it's not static, but we have to dynamically update it. And we're going to set the positions in this buffer and then push it back again to the GL side. Now, if you've done a lot of GL coding, you're probably watching this with your hands, your head in your hands going, oh my god, what's this guy doing? Does he have any idea how GL works? And well, number one, yeah, maybe that's a question how much I really know about GL. Um, I've done actual, I've done a lot of stuff in GL, but it's been through slight wrappers and different interfaces, and I always forget this. And secondly, this is just the baseline to get it working. Eventually, we'll actually have to start constructing more of a pipeline here and get this working better. What I'll be relying on now is, let's be realistic here, a game like Wormies, I could do the GL like an utter idiot. I could, I could go out of my way to make this inefficient, and my desktop video card is going to have no problem rendering it at a top speed. It's just not going to be an issue. I mean, the GL driver is such a point that I'm not going to challenge this thing at all. So I'm just not caring about it right now. We'll worry about that later when we actually add effects. And that'll be much, much, much later. <laughs> All right, so we move, we, we, we update this now. The vertex data is set each time. So now we can move it around and I've got it upside down. And I'm pressing up now and this is down, which makes sense, right? Because down is lowering the Y value in my game board is upside down. And from a coding standpoint, this makes a lot of sense to have the origin up there in the corner. But let's look at the error I have first. When I go right off the screen, I, I disappear. It's uncertain what the game should do at this point. It could probably crash, but let's make it wrap around first just so we have an understanding of how it works. And let's fix the up and down. We're going to make up one. Oh, that was already upside and down minus one. Wait, that means my game is actually inverted. Oh yeah, this the curse of GL, the inversion, up invert, up invert. And what we can do now is we can say instead of doing plus equals do mod head position dot x plus x offset and mod it with the size dot x. It's always within that range. This mod is not the same as the C modulus operator. It does a proper signed mod because the C one doesn't work on negatives. Okay, it works as ways to find it, but it's not defined in a useful way. And they define it that way because it's really cheap to implement. The proper mod actually says, if this is negative, it'll always be within the range of zero to size X. Even if it's negative, it'll properly clip to that range. So mod head position out Y. And when you're making your own language, you get the choice and saying you get to make these options and you get to fix these things and say, look, I don't care that this is four instructions compared to like, one, I just don't care. If you want mod, you want the proper mod. All right, and that should be enough to wrap it around. Let's hope. There we go, we can wrap it around. So now we have it moving around the screen. It wraps around. <laughs> Wonderful, huh? <laughs> um, not very exciting, but this is, this is all, again, this is all leaf, so it's really cool. We have the basics to it, you can move it around. The next step, of course, will be we need to make this thing grow. We need to make them get longer. Before we make it longer, let's just get into be a fixed length first. Or maybe we should change the indexing. And 
video. You know, we should always use index mode. We should always use index mode because it cuts down the number of vertices because every vertice is going to be basically doubled and we don't want that. What I'm unsure in GL is how to make the buffer slow, smaller. Okay. And again, this is relative to the screen size here. So we make it really small. Probably not ideal. You probably want to do it a different way. All right. So I hope you're enjoying this wonderful green dot on the screen so far. Again, if you have questions, please ask. Otherwise, I'll just keep going on this. I'm going to commit a lot of things. Get status. And... First head dot. And I can close the second view now, I think. Split view, close, current view. And what we'd want to do with the game now is we want to extract this into something that actually renders the game. We want to have something that's like a renderer. A renderer takes the current game state and deals with that. And so let's actually make a render. And thanks, beggars. Yeah, it's... it. it <laughs> That's my main point is that it, the graphics may not be good, but what's sitting behind this is, yeah, there's an absolute ton of stuff in the language that have to work to get to this point. And I'm doing this graphical approach to force me to get it to be a useful language as opposed to a theoretically fun language. I'm going to force this way, and then we have to force it to do all this stuff, getting all sorts of stuff working. And like I say, we're breaking off, and every time, and every time I break something off, so far we haven't hit a compiler error. I, I'm really impressed, actually. When I've been doing this the last four weeks, every time, every time I save the file, basically I got a compiler error. But I've been cleaning those up, and we'll go on. So let's split this off now to actually create a renderer system. And that is, we're going to split this code off so we have a renderer, we have a game state, and this is all split off, and the renderer is going to do its job on its own. So let's create a second class. And now, a renderer is going to be something called a service. I'm going to call it a game renderer. And what's the difference between a service and a class, you ask? You do ask. I know you're asking. You just don't want to type it in chat. Just admit it. Um, at the moment, there's not a lot. At the moment, well, let's talk about conceptually first. A class, a class in Leaf is a data type. A class is going to be like a point, like a game state, like your matrix, like your vector, like your any of your collection objects. These are all what I call classes. They're type objects. They're, they're complex data types and they're meant to behave like types. You can copy matrices, you multiply matrices and stuff. Whereas a service, a service performance, a service is saying like, look, I am not a data type. I don't represent something that has a value. I represent a communication with the outside world. And in this case, one of the popular ones is a file. A file is considered a service in Leaf because when you copy this object around in memory and stuff, you're not actually copying a file. This file object is just a gateway to the file system. You have to do explicit copy, explicit writing and stuff. And that's the same thing for a renderer. When I create this renderer, it's logically not a value type. It's, it's a service. It, it's representing an interface to the outside world. And this is the distinction Leaf is making. And I've hit this a lot in other frameworks where basically you do kind of want that distinction. It makes a lot of sense. Where if you take Java, Java kind of had the one that said fundamental data types are copies and everything else is basically like a service and you couldn't choose. And I'm trying to formalize this because I think it's really common to actually have this structure. You have services and types and they're fundamentally different things. And we're going to keep going with that. And at the moment, the biggest difference is that when you create a service type, it's automatically shared. You, you can't copy these things. You just keep getting a shared pointer throughout it, and that simplifies the syntax. Some syntax issues there alone, we'll figure that one out. But, so the game render, now we're going to copy all that stuff we had from main, and I'm going to split this again just after I finished saying that. I think it's so annoying that it keeps reducing the size. Okay, I'm not happy with my editor. I don't have a replacement yet. I'm very picky about editors, and I have none that satisfy me so far. All right, so we're going to have to have a program in here. We're going to have a 
program. It's a GL program. And we have a V position. Position. These are the. Uh, these are the attributes. Slash uniforms, whatever you want to call them, GL. Is it gluent? <coughs> yeah, this is a GL type. Um, I'm keeping their naming convention, and it's important to use these things because it could be different at different platforms. The integer sizes will vary. Game size position equals gluent. And let's do a constructor here. The default constructor. It should probably take a directory, but ah, for now, let's just hard code it. And let's copy some of this stuff over. We're going to link it. We're going to copy this over. So this is part of the program right here. I'm going to attach it. Program.attach. Program.link. And these will throw... They don't throw exceptions. The air handling and leaf, I won't want to call it exceptions. It works like exceptions, but there is no actual runtime exception like in C++. It's all handled via return values. And I'm doing this because I actually had it working with exception handling once, and I wrote an article about how ridiculously complex zero-cost exception handling is, and there's some significant drawbacks to it. And so what I've done in leaf is I decided instead, well, no, in a modern language, errors happen all the damn time. You can't rely on the fact that they don't happen infrequently. And you always get the discussion then because exceptions can be costly or hard to deal with, then you have this constant argument of like, well, is this really an exception or is it an error? What is this thing? And so in Leaf, I just I say, no, look, they're all simple errors. I don't care what it is. It's an error. If it doesn't do what it wants, it doesn't do what it's supposed to, it's an error. And to make this work efficiently, I think everything is just going to have return values. And so when you return from a function, it's always going to be a branch. Branch, did it fail? Did it fail? Did it fail? And But this is all internal details. From the user of the program, you don't care. Just an error. Okay, so we have the basic there. And then we're going to have that vertex data here. Var vertex data. And this is going to be a GL buffer. Uh oh, I might have made a mistake here in the code. We might have to have compiler support. I can't remember how initialization works. This might fail on us float too. Well, let's get it without this first. Let's just do all this stuff here first. We have a geo. This is not a program. We now have a renderer. Renderer is a game renderer. And yeah, this is initialized by default. And this is exactly the argument too, but and the reason I initialized by default is Leaf says there are no uninitialized values. I'm sorry, you just can't have an uninitialized. If you really want something uninitialized, there's something called undefined or will be. By default, it's always initialized. And this may be a little bit weird for service types, because for service types, it's like, well, well that's weird. <laughs> but it works. And it should do a default initialization. And root text data. So we need to find where we did that. Game render, game render, root text, by and push, wherever this was. And program that use. We're just going to directly hook into this right now. Render dot program use. Render v position, render v position render it up program and just to get this basically working the way it is already and you notice that short pause before it loads okay so this is still working like when I do this that that small pause I actually tracked this down once and, and surprisingly it's I was hoping it would be my code because my code currently in the compiler is very inefficient, but it's mainly the LLVM code, which I'm really surprised about. So it's actually the compile, the actual LLVM processing and stuff that's taking a long time. And I mean, it's not horrible. If you compare it to other systems, I've actually compiled and launched a program in like a couple seconds, which is still quite good. But you know, it's me that nagging feeling that it should be faster. 
And I'm going to have to probably work the LLVM side. It's not my specialty. Figure out how I can make this stuff faster. And I know a few ways I can make it faster, of course, is that right now we have a lot of files. If I stuck all the count, if I stuck this entire lib directory here in an actual library, which you can, of course, do, then it would be faster. But for now, I'm not going to worry about it because for now it's still bearable. And I think it might be one time overhead cost in LLVM. That is, it might not get any slower as I add more code. Even though the, my compiler, the high end stuff, is getting slower. But I'm surprised that, I'm actually surprised so far that my high end compiler isn't very slow. It's actually quite fast. The code it produces is slow and ugly, but the actual compilation is okay so far. So, okay, so we did the basic thing there. Now, we're going to try and stick this renderer in here. Var. Oh, wait, I'm being silly here. We can actually do it this way. Vertex data. I keep forgetting about features to implement in my own language. Yo buffer GL float to GL array buffer. This should work. And we have to use it now. Let's be renderer. Okay, this is getting silly. I just want to test it again though. Again, I'm just testing everything bit by bit. If you've, if you've not written a compiler before, my nervousness is because of... I'm getting really nervous when there's error messages that I have to know what bits of code change to produce it because the error messages aren't necessarily so good yet. All right, so this is going to work. Okay, and... So we can get rid of this bit. We don't need this bit anymore. We're gonna just update each time. We're gonna do a GL nuclear. We're gonna do renderer dot render the state. So we're gonna render the whole state in that program now. And the state is a shared game. So we're gonna create a render function, define render, and it has a state, and this is a shared game. And here we're going to do program.use. I keep typing semicolons because I keep, I mean, I use a lot of language semicolons, but they're not here. Okay, and we can move this stuff over to render, or move it all over to render. And we'll have to do something here, the set state here. We're going to set, update the state each time. But there's an issue here at the set because we haven't set it yet so far. If it's above the size of the buffer, it's going to fail on us. It'll do a memory error. I don't have safety yet there on that. Um, that's the goal that if you try to set something out of memory, it will cause an error. But at the moment, it just crashes. Sorry. And we can move this all into here. And the swap thing is not part of the renderer. This render doesn't care that it's in an SDL window. The render is just pure GL. And so V position position. We're now inside the render context. So program set uniform. Game size position. And this is state size states there. That's good. Index data, GL bind buffer. Disable vertex V position position. And where are we here? We had some other stuff. We had the index data, which has to go up there as well. Var index data equals G, what, is there an extra space here? Yeah. GL buffer. And this is just a, two integers. GL element array buffer. We have to say what type it is. I mean, this is a holdout from like GL 1.0 fixed pipelines. I don't think any of the drivers actually care about this anymore. I really don't know. I mean, they have generic memory. I don't think they actually change anything based on what buffer you want, other than some linking criteria. And we can initialize this in in the constructor then, because it's fixed. And we get rid of it out here. 
Okay, and just for sanity right now, let's actually do the vertex data dot push zero comma zero. Just put a bunch of values here, just to make it the right length so we don't crash on that. And with any luck, any luck, renderer, yeah, okay. We don't have that anymore. All right, it works, wonderful. That's going, to be honest, it's going better than expected. <laughs> I mean, I, I have like, Leaf has like nearly a thousand unit tests, which are all little tiny programs. Um, some complex, but mostly small. But every time I see something working with it, I, I'm still like surprised. I'm surprised when it works. I mean, I, I shouldn't be, but it's sort of that's, Am I doing something right? Because I don't know if I'm doing the compiler right. Nobody can tell me that. And that's good though, we have that. So we've completely abstracted that and that's good. So now we have this main run function and it doesn't care. It doesn't know how it's rendering. The main run function deals with the state. It moves the stuff around, it deals with the state and then it calls renderer state, just gives it the state. And therefore we can actually see We've separated off the render, so if you wanted to build a different backend renderer, we could. It's going to have to duplicate everything every time, but that's okay. We have that, and the renderer has very basic stuff in it. But that's enough. So let's check our status in this again. Get add wormies game renderer. Get commit am separated the renderer. Now there's going to have to be more separation in this main thing dealing with these events and stuff to clarify. But we'll get to that in time. When the loops are small, you don't want to start prematurely. You know how there's premature optimization? There's like premature refactoring and premature architecture. A lot of people are very guilty of premature, premature architecting. And you can't architect something. I have an example. I have three things in here and they all do something fundamentally different. This is not enough data points yet to decide what the architecture should look like. And the code isn't so hard to deal with here. Sure, on the stream it's hard to look at, but that's because I have a big font in one window and I'm trying to show you that. It's actually not that much here. There's 57 lines in the main code. That's totally acceptable to deal with. Now this GL float should be part of the renderer because the main code doesn't care about it, which makes it even shorter. All right. So the next step we wanted to do is we want to give this give this worm multiple segments. It, it has to have a position, so it's no longer just a head. It has multiple positions on it. And what I think I'm going to do first is we're not going to optimize the render for drawing segments. We're just going to draw a bunch of individual boxes. And how can we do that? This is where actually creating a rendering pipeline gets annoying because it's like, it should be super simple. I just want to create a bunch of boxes, but I have to have a vertex array and it's going to have a dynamic size and I have to say where they are and... Oh yeah, the one thing I wanted to change first was vertex data. I'm going to close this window first so we don't have to look at two things at once. I had to do this push here. I pushed it here. And what I should better do is I should have a clear function. Vertex data dot clear. And that'll push, that'll clear the data. But we have to write that function because this is actually our code. And this is over in the lib. This is a GL buffer. GL buffer. This is a parametric type. These are in, in leaf two parametric types. You denote them. You have these funny symbols here. Now, there's a story behind these symbols is that, why am I not using the normal symbols? Why, and by normal symbols, I mean, why is this not like this in C++? And it's because these symbols in all the languages, when you override these symbols, these less than and greater than four arguments for, parameter, for parameterization, it messes with your parser and it messes with the semantics because you start having duplicates. 
and you start lacking the ability to put ranges in notation. So this really causes trouble to have this type of notation, especially when you have a rich type language. Like, what if I have to say t, but where t is greater than five or something? You have this, and this is exactly the problem C++ has, and so I wanted to avoid that. But there's not a lot of options for matching character types. And so it's like, well, what do I use? And I should say these symbols are exactly the same as I had to make it so you can use it on a normal keyboard. So you can use these symbols as well. Colon greater than less than colon. These are an option too. In case you don't want to modify your keyboard to type the nice ones in, you can use that. And these other ones, I forget which language they're actually from. But they form a nice set. And I'm really happy with the way they look, and it's a common set. It's available. It's a common enough syntax that pretty much all the fonts have them. And beggars, um, for this symbol here, I'm not thinking of change. I'm yes, yes, and no. I'm actually thinking of making this a standard arrow. So all of the all these combination operators, all these multi sequence operators, will eventually get a single character equivalent. Because I think it just looks nicer when you're programming if you have an actual arrow here. And for now, I haven't done that one. Again, this one's not as high on my list of priorities because this one compiles as well. But this one up here was pretty high on my list of priorities. But I will be introducing lots of symbols. And, I'm, and my intent is to use a whole bunch of Unicode where possible because we have IDEs that can simplify this stuff. We have automatic replacement. But there always will be an ASCII fallback because I'm not going to be that that guy that makes you install all this crap just to use the language, there will be an ASCII fallback. Right now I'm not done too heavy on this stuff because my actual parser, it doesn't handle Unicode correctly. As silly as that may sound, it's not doing proper Unicode regexes. And so I have to be careful a little bit of how I do this stuff still. It's not that simple and I have to fix the parser first. I have to use proper Unicode regexes and then I'll start doing those types of changes. For those of all looking for the characters, they're like this. It's also in the readme file of Leaf where they get them from. You may also see in some places you're gonna have this character. This character is a fun one. Um, this character looks awful and it's used for internal types. So instead of instead of C's double underscore, like double double internal name, I use this thing intern name. It's pretty obvious that you shouldn't be using these in user code and so in double underscores they have no meaning here. Okay. Uh, the underscore up here just to note this this is nothing to do with syntax this is a semantic thing I don't have visibility yet for classes and services so I'm using the Python like convention or is it JavaScript or wherever wherever this convention comes from underscore means private for now this will eventually be enforced by the language itself. But for now, we just realize don't access things with underscores. All right, so we wanted to have a clear function on here to find clear. And this is using a collections vector. And I honestly don't know if that has a clear operation on it. <laughs> um, but the renderer should also stop calling set and should go back to calling push. We're going to find out if we have a clear operator yet. Right away, push. Does not contain the symbol clear. Um, let's go find out. This is part of the Leaf's experimental standard library. Not in byte block, in master, in. Da, 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 da. Share standard library. X collections is X experimental. Technically, they're all experimental. And it does indeed not have a reset function. Now, I don't develop on master, so I'm going to have to go create a branch here. It's going to take a few seconds to do. Ah, source slash leaf. Dot slash create branch master. This is just using bizarre branching. But I have a script which wraps the Dropbox stuff as well to exclude it from Dropbox and not copy everything all the time. And let's just call the branch Wormies1. 
Or it's called Wormy January, February, March, April, and April? Wormy's April. And we'll compile this, then we'll compile this, and then I can start making changes to the standard library and rebuilding, rebuilding that first. And we'll just add a clear function to it. All right, so we're gonna go change to it. Wormy's April. I should be able to run dist and produce the distribution. This will take a little second compile. It's probably gonna hurt OBS. Um, I only have eight cores. <laughs> I only have eight cores. Yeah, okay. I've been looking to upgrade my computer. Um, I'm gonna basically, the next one I have is gonna be AMD probably as well. I might get a 16 core. I might go to 32 core. But then it's an issue that I like quiet computers, so I need to get like a 16 or 32 core that also has a fan backup. Because if you ever actually compile with all those cores running at 100%, no silent system is going to remain silent forever. They're going to overheat on you. Um, you have to have a fan somewhere. I mean, it might work. I've had my old one work. This one works, could work without the fan turning on for a good hour at 100%, but it started beeping and giving you warnings and stuff, so... I'll probably upgrade and do that. All right, I'm just going to wait for this to compile, and then we can modify that. We can probably modify it right away, so that time it gets to the compilation, it'll actually modify the current one. Source or leaf, wormies, share, standard library, x collections, vector. Let's make a clear function. Get expand, clear, remove. Let's do clear. So this is where the clear function you have to be very, this is no longer easy to write because we have to do clearing and I'm just gonna cheat for now. properly reset data items. Writing actual vectors, part of a standard library, a full proper vector class that does the memory management every directory is actually a lot of work. And that's not what the stream is for, but I'll keep a list of the stuff I actually have to do. I just put to do's everywhere. To do's, to do's, to do's. Because you'll notice the remove. The remove does a lot of stuff because it has to move it. And then it resets all the variables. It resets it to type. And this is actually technically incorrect. It should do like C++. It should actually destroy that variable there. But this is some part of advanced memory management, advanced data management I don't have yet in Leaf. But if you want to do a custom collection, you actually have to be able to destroy and create items in place. You, you, it has to be exposed at the user level, otherwise it won't work. All right, and so that just rebuilt it. And that should be good enough. We have to use a different one, not master. Now we have Wormies distribution. All right, that's good enough. Now we have it clear, and so the clear is working now. Yay, woo, whoop, 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 whoop. Now let's just push two of these things on for now. And close this off here, and this buffer, wait, 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 is a game render. Now you notice this index is we're always pushing the same four. We might want to make a better buffering thing and we might want to say, let's put a function, a helper function here. Make it internal push box. And it's going to take, what is it going to take? It has to take four parameters. What do we name these four parameters? These are the corners of the box. And I don't know, I just call them A, B, C, D. A is a. Actually, these are integers, though. So we can actually just do integer. These are I.2. And we'll convert in this program. So the state, I think we call it I.2. I.2, I point, just I.2. A I point, B I point. And these should be specific points of the box though. Mm -hmm. 
vertex data dot push this is sorry say a dot x actually if we're pushing a box we only need one point much simpler position we'll make a help for function to do that Okay, now we have these index things, and what I want to try and do here, I'm going to push the box first, and we take the state and the head position. So we push that box, it's going to rebind it. At the end, it'll rebind it. For now, let's just clear the index data as well, okay? Index data are clear, and we'll repush this every single time. Again, we don't have to worry about the efficiency of this. Efficiency be damned. The graphics cards we're dealing with just don't care. <laughs> they have to deal with thousands upon thousands of vertex changes. So I just don't need to worry about this yet. Um, but this would really be like, don't update if not changed. But these indexes are going to have to actually do it. And I'm actually going to say it's static as well. All right, maybe make it dynamic. I'll leave it static. We'll taunt the driver. And this really, we're pushing, and we have these four things here. We take the first position, first vertex VDPZ equals vertex data. And now we need to know what the position is. I don't think we exposed that yet. GL buffer. All right, definition size. And here's where the implicit return is going to help. I don't define it, but then I can just return it data dot. Oh, I hope I defined a size for this. Is there a size function? There's a get size. Thankfully, there's a get size function. Get size. So we return the size, and this should actually be get size as well. I don't have accessors yet. Accessors will, will come, and accessors where you can just say size and dot size, but we're going to make it a function for now called get size. And this will return the size, and then we do it here wherever we were. Get size. And now we push those vertexes into the things, the indexes. This is, this is going to fail on me. Because um, <laughs> we're using a triangle fan. Well, let's just try it for now. VDP plus one is zero. Um, let's see if it still works. Now we got errors. Um, 40. Ah, yeah, because this is the wrong size as well. So we're just going to do a lossy here, and this is a GL uint. It's a bit smaller than the size. The size is going to be a natural int, and it still works. That's good to know. Or, or I'm not actually making any changes. You know, I'm going to do. Okay, we did compile. We had the error, and I'm going to double check we're using the right code. Not that I'm being an idiot. All right, so we are using the right code. I have done that before. And so now I want to push a, set, a second position just to test it with push box. And let's just do 3, 4. And see if we actually draw multiple boxes. Probably not yet. We have to update something else as well. No. So we still don't have enough. And this is the triangle fan here, the number of elements. And this is index data that gets size. And I don't know if this is a correct fan anymore. This is probably not a fan. We're going to have to update that. And this, again, we're going to have to have a lossy because it's too big. You can do a specific type, or you can just say lossy. All right, so this is where the triangle fan is going to fail us. Um, we're going to have to stop using a triangle fan. 
Or if they're right beside each other, their triangle fan might work. On one side, at least. Okay, but no more triangle fan for us. Which means our indexes are going to be longer. It's going to take off the second box. And we're going to go to the GL reference. Triangle fan GL draw elements. What is GL draw elements? Mode GL points line strip. Um, triangles. There it is. GL triangles. GL triangles is what I want. Did there not used to be quads? I thought there was. I thought there were quads at some point. Hmm. So let's just do GL, GL triangles. Now we don't have enough indexes for triangles, so if we just change it to this, it's going to do something funky. It's going to give us an error first because triangles is not defined. Lib, go to GL, GL triangle fan, and now we have to look up what triangles it is. User include GL core, core arb, GL triangles. Okay, but I guess they were deprecated. I know they were deprecated from GS. I just thought they still existed in the main, in the full script. I mean, I don't think anybody uses them. I guess all the engine did was it just decomposed them into uh, triangles anyways. So this is what I'm doing right now, this manual setting up these constants here. Ultimately, we'll use a library and I think it was actually Baggers here that recommended it to me called lib2cffi, which can parse the files and generate this stuff for me. But because there's so much stuff I have to manually add, there's no way I can import the full library yet. So I'm just piece, bit, piece by piece importing the ones that I need for now. So now you can see we're missing triangles because we only have four. And let's go back to the renderer. This is all standard, so we need to import a few more. So if this is the bottom, i got to think of the winding mode. This is the bottom left, bottom right, top right. So that's the correct winding mode. This is the first triangle. And then the second triangle, we can start from zero again. And then we want to go top right and top left. And because this is probably inverted, I probably have the winding wrong. We might see nothing. Oh, we still see something. Or my culling might be off. I might just have the wrong culling. So let's push a second box here. We have two boxes now. That's wonderful. I like boxes. Doesn't everybody like boxes? And we can even create more boxes. Um, you notice when I press Control C, this is an SDL thing. Control C is actually properly destroying. It's not like just hard coding killing it. It's actually cleaning up, if that interests you. Push box and 21 comma 17. All right, so we actually have multiple boxes. Let's test that they're actually working correctly. Let's do state.head.position. Let's just make it mirror. And then always on four. And then I think I have a size here, state dot. State dot size, size dot x minus, state dot head position dot x minus one. And this one too, state dot size dot y minus. And this is just doing random stuff to see that we're working. Um, 53. All right, because this has to be position dot x. All right, so now we have three moving. We have the very basics of a super complex 2D drawn snakes like wormy rendering engine. Um, but this is enough. This is gets, this can get us to the next stage of actually creating a worm that moves around.
So now we actually have to create a worm though. So how do we want to create this worm? Um, it's the last thing I'm going to do today is we just want to create a worm somehow. So this head position here, we have a head position. And we want to say we want to have a stack of positions as well. So we're going to have a second vector here. Where do I have that buffer? All right, so we're going to have X collections again. I point, geo point. No, this is part of the game state. Looking at the wrong object, that's why. Um, game leaf. We don't have just a head position. We're going to have to have, I don't know what, the full body. And this is going to be a vector of I point. This will be the full body for the creature. And whenever they move, when do body dot add head position? Let's see if it still works. I think it's screwing something up. Whoa, vector. Ah, yeah, because it's in x collect. It's in collections. I imported it as collections, and that's an import as we did in another file. And this thing is getting longer, but we're not drawing it. And so we're gonna do a for loop on that. The for loops are still kind of iffy in leaf. And, and don't think just because this is my own language, I'm going to cut it any slack. If I see crap or you see crap, just point it out. I mean, anything that looks like crap has to be fixed. And I'm not going to delude myself into thinking everything's wonderful. There will be crap, and we need to fix the crap. That's just the way it is. So, but we can do this. 4i in standard range 0, comma state dot... I forgot what it's called already. State.body.getSize. Now, there is a syntax like this. I do have this syntax, and it's totally under-tested and under-supported, and I'm not so certain, certain I want to keep it for things like for loops, because there's a lot of issues to what it actually means. Does it include the last one and range here? And range is most likely going to become X range as well, to mean an exclusive range. Because it's one of those things that it seems totally obvious that range is going to be exclusive until the situation where it's not. And so maybe you have an I range as well. And so I might not have the shortcut syntax. The little dot dot syntax may also be used for slicing as well. I'm using the rush term there. I fully intend to have some sort of slicing syntax where you can take a part of a tuple. And I actually think parts of tuples do work, but we just don't need them right now. So I'm just going to use this range here. And this is not a good iterator syntax. And there are actual iterators and stuff. But again, it's a very underdeveloped part of the system. So I'm not going to taunt it right now with doing that. I'll do it offline. And if I find the better syntax, I'll do it. So state.body hash i. And you'll also notice my subscript syntax here, hash. This is taking the URL fragment identifier. The reason for this is, is because array i this is such a nice combination of brackets to waste on subscripting. Just waste it. So instead, in Leaf, as you've been seeing, those subscript things, what you would call subscript C, the square brackets, always denote a tuple. They always denote a tuple. They do never, never indicate subscripts. And that's extremely explicit. All right. So now we have these boxes. With any luck, with any luck, luck, oh, not quite yet. Um, uh oh, we got one of these weird errors. Index not supported. Oh, yeah, because, yeah, <laughs> sorry. This is a high level class. Indexing is not supported, so forget that whole spiel I just did. All right, skip the first one. That's fine. Look, we have a worm. Woohoo! Yay, worm! Now, we probably should clear up the tail, but. Oh, let's, we can clear up the table, table as well. That's no problem. Now, we missed the first one. We missed the head position. So clear that off. Let's go back to game. Um, so Bagger's asking, does range produce something like Python's generator, or is it producing an array list slash whatever? Yes. <laughs> Um, we can actually look at the code for what it's producing and give you a better idea of what it's actually doing. It's producing a, 
it's producing a small tuple which has the logic contained required. So it's more of an iterator. It's creating an iterator object, let's say. So more like a generator. Share standard line E, standard range. So it's producing this thing called exclusive range iterator. And these are duct typed iterators. So the for syntax in leaf, it doesn't care what type it gets, so long as it has the function called has more step and get. And so range does exactly that. We have range, and there's also an inclusive, inclusive range which does the same thing. So we have both of those, and we have different stepping. So as far as least concerned, as long as your object has these three items in it, has more step and get, it can be used inside a for loop. And so that's more, I think that's closer to the generator. This is not producing, this is closer to the generator approach. And you can actually implement the same thing on a vector. I just haven't gotten around to it yet. But obviously a vector will have like an iter function, which is going to return the same thing. There's a bit of a memory management issue right now on how to handle references. And it's something I still have to look at. I think I'm going to have to go into the rush direction of tracking dependencies so I know when references are safe. It's very easy to code right now to do the references, but they would be unsafe and I want to fix that. So that's what we have there. So game, we have leaf. Now we could also, if the thing is too long, so body dot get size. Let's say if it's longer than 10, body dot remove at zero. Good. What am I missing now? Unexpected note type. This is one of those miscellaneous errors. This is when the parser got the situation that goes blah, I don't know what you're talking about. And it's usually pretty obvious, like you're missing it then, but I have to get errors improved there. All right, so now we have the actual worm. He can walk through the edges of the board, that's fine. He can even walk through himself. Nobody cares about that yet. But we have an actual worm, and I'm very happy I got this far. We have a worm. The next step would be to use a timer. I'd have to look something up. So it has a current direction. So let's give this thing a timer now. So it walks on its own, and we just change the direction of it. We won't worry about collision and stuff like that yet. Get status, get commit. Body of the worm. I can say this is going much better than I had anticipated. The prep work is paying off. Um, again, it, oh, one more thing to point out. The syntax then and leaf. I was really worried about how I combined then and else syntax in a compact way as opposed to having an if so this is just a syntax. These are branches, and you can replace it with an else instead, or you can combine them together. And these are actually instruction branches. They do not do values. The optional values we can see, I'll show you at some other time. And so what I actually want to hear now is I want to have our direction is an I point. And we're going to say direction equals x off comma y off. And you'll notice a lot of this stuff here is that this is a non-explicit type, but the the inferencing engine, the, the implied engine will figure out that this maps properly to an I point. If you've seen the Rush show, this does not do any type balancing. It's strictly one direction. It says, create this type and how do I convert it to this type? It's not going to balance both ways. I find this to be a much cleaner approach. And it actually, unlike I think compared to Rust, you end up typing the types in Leaf far less often than you would in Rust because the inferencing is one way. It has a much better chance of knowing what type you're actually using because it doesn't actually have to balance and unify as much. So let's make a step function now as well. And the step function is simply going to do move direction.x direction.y. We're just going to call move on ourselves. Okay, now, I'll show you, we're going we're to have to have timing here. 
I'm going to do state.step, and this is going to be crazy because this is going to go at the frame rate. Well, that's not going as fast as it should. One. Or maybe it is. Maybe that is covering. Uh, So now it's automated. I don't know what the default frame rate is, but this seems like it's going too slow. This does not seem like 60 frames per second. That is, he's stepping once per second. So if we go across, there's 30, one, two, hey, that actually might be 60 frames. That might be 60 updates a second. So it's going too fast, but we have it automated. And this is the part I have to check in uh, SDL, how we do that. Yeah, I'm sure it's, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely sure it's capped to 60 frames per second. I'm just not sure if this is 60 frames per second. Is it going across the screen twice per second? One, two, it might be. It's probably close enough. And again, because it's using the compositor, and this is what I like about Linux, the composition, SDL and GL, is that it keeps running as you're doing this with the wobbliness. It doesn't care. The whole thing keeps running as you're moving the window and you can actually see it in the pop-up as well. I just, I just love, I love modern desktop layering in the 3D engine that this all works and because we plug into the standard libraries this works perfectly. There are live updates there as well. Now, um, what else can I do here? Well, so the timing. Let's figure out in SDL. Does SDL have some sort of time interface? Time. Category timer. Hmm. 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 Yeah, but I, I am using swap interview already. So I definitely have swap interval. Actually, let's try turning that off for a second, lib. In this thing called GL SDL GL window, we do set swap interval to one. Let's set it to zero and see if it goes crazy. Oh yeah, that goes crazy. So that looks... <laughs> so we are capped to 60, so it can definitely do a lot faster than that. Who knows how fast that's actually running. But let's put the swap interval back and let's go figure out the timing. We have get performance frequency get ticks. What is get ticks? I'm calling the SDL functions, although I could just call clock get time because it's a POSIX function. I don't know how portable it is, but to be honest, since Leaf only works on Linux and Mac right now anyways, I shouldn't have to care, but I really do want to keep portability in mind. If I ever get a volunteer that wants to port the build chain to Windows, there's no reason Leaf can't work there. It's just a matter of priority that it's all the build because all those libraries like LLVM, uh, the big number library, and scones and all this stuff to set up is a lot of work on Windows. And I don't have much experience there, so it's just not been my priority. But if somebody who really loves Windows and does dev and Windows wants to come and help out, that'd be excellent. It, sh it shouldn't be a big deal getting this running on Windows if you know how to build, build chains there. All right, an unsigned 32-bit value well, this is scary. A 32-bit value representing the number of milliseconds. Okay, so the high-res counter is the one we want to go. Well, let's check that one out first then. High-res, get performance counter. Well, this one's complicated then. Uh, get performance frequency. Well, let's just use these ones. Well, I don't know. Maybe we should use a get ticks. Because this is probably going to be... Alright, we're not... Nobody's, nobody's going to be playing the Worms game long enough <laughs> to overflow the ticks. Um, if, if, if eventually somebody runs the Wormies game long enough to overflow ticks, I'll assume I'll be super happy about that. But let's just use get ticks for now. 
and I'll show you how you import a function. I'm assuming I had the problem that this may not be a real function. We're going to find out. Some of these are macros in uh, in SDL. But let's just add this one here, SDL. We have that. I'm going to import it. And we're going to do SDL get ticks. This is the importing name. This is using the standard tool chain, so you don't import from a specific library. It's going to be the linker that does that. The linker is going to do this name thing. And we use multi for now, just completely ignore that. It's, it should be definition, to be honest. But just just pretend you don't see multi. SDL get ticks. And now we say what we're importing. The signature we're importing is it has no arguments like that. And it's returning a. And it's very specifically a uint32, which I find really weird. It's not like a ABI int or an ABI small int. This is really just an integer 32 and it's unsigned. In Leaf, unsigned integers are not quite the same as integers. It's not a special class. It's a completely different type called binary. They serve a different purpose. These are binary numbers. You can still add and subtract from them, but they offer different facilities. And it's a binary 32 bit. And it's a raw no throw function. This is going to be replaced with something called an ABI function, which says more specifically this is a native API function. But for now, just raw and no throw mean the same thing. They totally old names I haven't updated yet. Now, if you're wondering about this 32 bit, is this really can is this really variable or like fixed amounts? Yeah, you can actually do 27 bit if you want you can do 33 bits and these actually work again this is LLVM doing this LLVM will actually give you a 33 bit value and its overflow will be correct for 33 bits it won't magically make it 32 or 64 but we actually want 32 bits here and we're hoping it's the right size so we have get ticks and now we're gonna go back to the main function so when the game starts we're gonna say gonna say last ticks equals SDL get ticks actually start ticks um, and this is the core of a game how you do the timing thing this is always a real pain you have to worry about aliasing you want it to line up to a frames so either you have to tie it to a frame or yeah okay let's just this is a pain let's just let's pretend we have the right thing for now and we'll get into temporal layers and guess I'll get ticks. Last ticks. And so right here we're going to do var current ticks. Actually, let's do this with var last ticks var elapsed equals zero. Elapsed ticks. And this is a UN32. Now you can actually do this type of infer type. I think this is a text of last ticks. So whatever the hell last ticks is, you don't have to say what type it is, whatever that is, we're gonna make this the same thing. That might be the wrong syntax, but we'll worry about that in a second. Current ticks equals SDL get ticks. Elapsed ticks plus equals current ticks minus last ticks and last ticks equals current ticks standard timer loop and while elapsed ticks these are millisecond ticks is greater than let's say four times a second and step the state and elapsed ticks minus equals 250 and I probably have the syntax wrong on one thing Wormy's main 21 that's right here this type infer there it is type infer instead um, notice it doesn't just say type of it says type infer that says if you would assign it to last ticks what will be the resulting type of this assignment? What would be the inferred type of that? 
And so type infer of this expression, what is the inferred type of this expression? Because the inferred type is not always the same as the type itself, because if you have pointers shared and things like this, it's actually going to unwrap some of it. So it's the inferred type. Elastics is wrong, of course. Elastics. All right, so now we have it a bit slower. And you notice I press a key, it goes fast. And we're going to have to fix that for the actual game. Because it's going to have to queue it up. Now, the issue with doing it this way is that we're not... I put 250... And this actually lines up with the frame rate of 60. But when you have low frame rates, and this is a real issue for... For a step-based game like this one, and for classic arcade games, where anything where you have very fixed pixels and stuff, getting the timer right can be a real pain in the ass because you have to deal with temporal aliasing. Because if your movement doesn't line up with the screen, you're going to occasionally jump screens. It's occasionally just going to sort of jump and go an extra screen. And I don't have the resolution here high enough that you would see this, but that's something that can happen in temporal aliasing. When you have 3D games, you don't have to worry about as much when your <clears throat> when your game space is continuous. Temporal aliasing is a little easier to deal with because you can just deal with different time fragments, and you're going to run your simulation at a much higher rate than the graphics. And the graphics can come in whenever they want, but for a step-based game like this one, it can be a real pain that if you're running at the uh, a frequency that doesn't line up with the tick, tick rate, you'll you'll get problems in the rendering. I'm sure it's something that Ferris has talked about on his stream when he was doing emulation of old games. Is getting the clock right can be a major pain in the ass. All right, but now we have it. We have an actual worm that walks around at a reasonable rate. I'm happy with the progress we have today. I think I'm going to leave it here. A nice worm walking around. And when I do it again, um, we can start actually adding actual obstacles. Okay, I've never tried putting it in the background. Hopefully it recovers. It might do a jump. Oh yeah, it's fine. Time stepping. All right, so I'm not sure when I come back to this. Maybe tomorrow. If I get some chance, I'll come back tomorrow. Because we actually have to start making the game. The next step will make him go eat a dot. Fix this thing with moving. Make him go eat a dot and make him get longer. And if he runs into himself, he dies. That'll be the next step, the basic step of the game. Hopefully I get a chance to do it tomorrow. I think so. Um, I don't have anything else to do. <laughs> uh, but it'll be later in the afternoon. Tonight I'm undecided if I do the Rust programming again. Um, that is, we're working on the bot. I might, if I'm feeling up to it, I might come back tonight. Otherwise, I'll come back tomorrow night and work on the rust again. This is going to be an issue when I'm working on two things at once. Which one gets priority? And it's not just a matter of being tired. It's a matter of my brain being exhausted from working from different languages because the compiler's in C++, and I'm writing this in a leaf, and then I have to jump over to Rust. And if it actually happens to be a day where I do work, I'm doing C Sharp and JavaScript as well. So sometimes my brain just says, no, screw it, Netflix. And that's a hard decision to make in advance. But okay, this is where we have it today. I'm, I'm, I'm super happy with this. And this is a, at the moment, this is an OpenGL accelerated worm walking across our screen. And this is all written in Leaf. We're using SDL and OpenGL. But all the driving code, all the structuring, all the game logic is all going to be written in Leaf. And this is my compiler. And that's over at leaflang.org. And probably just HTTP. Sometimes it gets annoying, puts the wrong one, leaflang.org. And you, if you want to contribute to the project, I'd be more than happy to. There's lots of stuff to work on with the compiler. And there's, there's, a, there's no standard library. There's no documentation right now. There's lots of holes missing, lots of functionality missing, and there's weird error messages. So basically, you can jump in and help wherever. It's a bit of an uphill climb. It's very difficult. But as we saw today, I can make some decent progress in this. We actually have a basic, basic controls of a simple game sort of working. 
and I'm quite happy with the progress for that. I am. I thought I want to get this far. That's good. I've got, and so I'm very happy for those of you who are watching. Um, please follow the show and follow me on Twitter and let me know what more you like to see. But I'm going to keep working on this one. We're going to write this game to completion because it's what LeafWrite needs right now is stuff that's written to completion to see how it works, file systems and stuff like this. And we can use SDL. We can add a gamepad to this because gamepads are more fun. We'll eventually add audio to that. I might have to break. I have to go buy a new machine to do audio. I have no Windows machine, and that's the only place I know where to do Windows or audio processing. And it's no fun if we just do stock audio. We'll make our own. I've got the keyboard. I've got the guitars here. We can do our own audio for this at some point. But that'll have to be put off until we get the basics working first. And that's where it stands. So thank you very much for watching. I hope you've had as much fun as I have. And we'll see you next time.